Spoiler alert. Voltron, Legendary Defender, Season 2. Spoiler alert. Do not watch this video until you have watched the season. Hello, I'm Lux. And I'm Ember. And this is our thoughts on Voltron, Legendary Defender, Season 2. This season was just as good as, maybe a little bit better than the last season. I think it's mostly because they got the uh, intro story out of the way. And we actually had 13 full episodes, not an hour pilot, and 11 other episodes. Yeah, well, it's always tough to start because you've got to establish your base story. You know, once everyone knows the cast that you're working with, you have more freedom to move forward because you don't have to spend time saying, This is Keith. He pilots the Red Lion. We know that by season two. Yeah, and I kind of made a mistake. I actually thought this season was 24 episodes because I read the total number of episodes there were. I said the total number of episodes in season two, which is 13, by the way. Yeah, so Lux and I were all set to binge watch up to episode 12 and we're like, really? This is where we're going mid-season. And then we went, oh, we only have one more episode. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we were wondering why, like, Netflix only had 13 episodes because I read somewhere that it was 24 and it's like, huh, 13 episodes. Like, don't they usually put the entire season up at once? <laughs> yes, Netflix is the home of binge watching. So yeah, we got a little confused. Well, I got confused. Ember was just like, hmm, this is interesting for a mid-season. They do have mid-season cliffhangers and stuff like that in a lot of shows, but apparently Voltron is not one of them. That also explains why we're like, some of these episodes feel rushed. Why aren't they extending these out into more episodes? It's because they only had 13 episodes to work with. For example, the season opener. I was expecting a good half the season to be the pilots separated and getting them back together. Or at least a full episode per pilot, not per set of pilots. We only had one pilot by herself, and that was Pidge, which is kind of funny where she ended up. You're like, why didn't she think of using the junk sooner? I mean, she's this... She's this techno geek that's great at scavenging stuff and putting things together. And the first thing she does is build mock-ups of her teammates, Alora and Koran. I just found that kind of interesting. I'm like, why didn't she jump to that conclusion sooner? Also, I mean, you've modified your lion. This ancient piece of advanced technology, which is one of those funny things that's always funny to me. It's like, advanced ancient technology. Interesting. Though that also reminds me of the fact that Okay, we finally find out why they're constantly attacking Voltron, even though they have stuff that's more advanced than Voltron, because Zarkon has a thing for the Black Lion. That's the only reason. I mean, they've defeated Voltron pretty much every time. Well, they could have defeated Voltron every time, but they wanted to capture Voltron, so they kind of went easy on him. Yes, because if you want to capture the super weapon, you can't totally destroy it. Though it's interesting how in this season we see the transition of, you know, it's all Voltron, Voltron, Voltron to Black Lion, Black Lion, Black Lion. Mm -hmm. And they did actually give hints in the first season that that's what was going on. And that's how um, Zarkon was tracking them and stuff like that. Though it's going to be an interesting switch over to um, Prince Lothor because he's hinted at at the very end of the episode. I wouldn't exactly call that a hint. Hagar flat out says, contact Prince Lothor. That's not a hint. I have a feeling that's going to change, and I'm not quite sure how. Will Prince Lothor still be going after Voltron, or will he just be completely trying to completely flatten them, which will completely change everything? Especially with Shiro missing. Hard to say, because if I recall correctly, and I didn't go back to my 80s Voltron DVDs to confirm... I seem to remember Lothor having a thing for Allura, and uh, some of the conflict that was going on was not necessarily getting Voltron, but getting the princess. That's a good point, especially if the princess does actually take over the Red Lion position or one of the other lions, because she doesn't have to take over the Red Lion this time. She didn't take over. The no, you're right. It wasn't the Red Lion. It was the Blue Lion. lion. But I'm saying Red Lion because Keith would move up to Black, and that would leave the Red Lion empty. Yes. And as uh, Lance said, he and the Blue Lion are very happy together. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So that means she would either take the Red Lion or one of the other pilots would take over Red and she would take over whatever Lion was empty. Yeah, but I can't really see Red letting Keith go. 
Red has gone after Keith and has been more protective of Keith than any other of the lions that we've seen. Yeah, and he has a really deep connection with him compared to everyone else. Yes, because Red has come to Keith's rescue multiple times. It's almost like this season was mostly focused on Keith. It didn't really spread the story around that much. It focused on Keith and a little bit on Alora and a little bit on Shiro. But mostly on Keith it felt to me. Well, we had a lot going on with Keith because he was trying to find out the story behind that blade mm -hmm. and what was going on there. And good catch, Internet, because the Internet helped us solidify our theory on like, yeah, he's half alien. Or at least part. Yeah. And that was now confirmed this season because he had to have Galra blood in order for that blade to react. But we were wrong in the fact that I thought it was his father, but based on... The trials and the images he got, it's his mother that's most likely the carrier of the genes and may actually be Galra because there's two hints in the series. One, how he kept saying, your mother is coming. She'll be here soon. And the fact that Galra, he found trapped inside the, what you might call it, I suddenly can't remember the name of it, but throwing up giant space monster that eats planets. Yes, because... My thought there when he rescued that Golra was, oh, that's his mother. Yeah, that's the first conclusion she jumped to. I was like, she may be his mother, is what I thought. Because first I was like, that's a female. And two, that's probably his mother. Also, I just realized we haven't really seen any female Golra. I'm pretty sure we've only seen males so far. But there have to be be females because Alora was able to pass as Golra just fine when she snuck aboard the ship with Shiro in season one. Yeah, I know, but I'm like, I don't think we've seen any females because we found out that Hagar's not Galra. She's Altaian, which just blew Alora's mind because she thought she, Koran, and the space mice were the only Altaians left, and she's been a real jerk about Keith having Golra blood for like half the season, it mm -hmm. felt like, which was really annoying because she didn't show that kind of attitude when she was masquerading with the other Golra. And if her hatred was that deep that she was being so blunt with Keith when she knows she's damaging the Voltron team by doing that, how could she pull off her masquerade in season one? Also, another thing that kind of at least blew Hagar's mind is. What's going on with her in that final battle? Yes, so Laura suddenly gets a power boost out of nowhere and pulls off some serious magic stuff. Yeah, though that brings up a problem, a small problem. It's not really a nitpick because it's slightly larger than a nitpick, but a problem I, I had with a couple episodes in this season. The whole, things kind of magically happened. Oh, look, things worked out. One particular episode was the one where they had to repair the lenses in their thing that creates the teleporting, and everything just lined up perfectly for them to have everything that they needed to fix the final oops problem. Yes, for Koran to have this old person's Altean disease called the Slipperies, for Hunk, who has been previously established as being a pretty good cook and verified again later in the season in the Mall episode. Which was an office episode? But continue, we'll go over that one. To put inedible items such as scabarite into the cookies and have cookies that look just like the lenses. And we as the audience were supposed to know this because we were shown what the damaged lenses looked like and then we were shown Hunk's cookies. Also manually holding all those lenses in place so there were just enough people to do that, to hold them all in exactly the right place while this incredibly dangerous laser goes off. It's kind of like the whole episode suffered from the Mary Sue syndrome. Just everything went just right. Yeah. It was like overly serendipitous. Though that's not saying we didn't enjoy the episode. Myself, I would have actually removed the whole lens problem and just gone with Coran's <laughs> disease. Would have been much better by itself in the episode as being a problem of him slowly learning how to stay stable and use his power and use his powers. <laughs> use his disease to his advantage, I think would have worked better as an episode, since we really haven't really gotten much character development on Koran, except for when he was becoming younger in the time loop in the first couple episodes. Yeah, we, we kind of jumped straight to the finale, and now we're working our way backwards, so bear with us. Maybe play this episode backwards. Hopefully it doesn't sound weird that way. <laughs> I have no idea what that is forwards, but hey! <laughs> 
That reminds me, me and my friends in college would record ourselves, play it backwards, try to mimic the sounds, then play that forwards. Then play, I should say, then play that backwards too. It came out pretty funny, really. But moving on. <laughs> Since we mentioned it, shall we move on to the mall episode? Yes, and we did need to have the Teledyne lenses damaged because that gave us the excuse to go to the space mall. When I heard space mall, I couldn't help but think of those old catalogs that you would find in some airplanes. I think it's called Sky Mall. Mm. Actually, I think that's out of business now, but... Yeah, but just the Sky Mall junk. Mm -hmm. Well, we got that with the Ginsu knife type booth. I particularly love the end sequence of that episode. Cow. I specifically said, holy cow, and then realized, I'm sorry for that pun. Yes. And then I was like, hmm, would you consider this a Weird Al reference? Because they're riding away on a cow. And that's how the video for Dare to be Stupid ends. Yeah, I really don't know if that would count as a reference. It might actually be. I would have to do some research online to see if anyone else is picking up on that. Or if the creators talk about it at some point. Because there's probably interviews going on right now. But this reminds me, they're definitely leading into a third season because of all the hints they're dropping. <laughs> well, yeah. And there's also still a ton of room for more character development. But I just love the overall feel of the mall episode because it was fun. We still had an important task to do, you mm -hmm. know, of finding the Lucite crystals. Though certain parts of it, I th think this may have been another thing they were referencing. I think they were referencing it was like Paul Blark Mall Cop or something like that. Yeah, whatever those Mall Cop comedy type movies and every comedic uh, Mall Cop character in like every sitcom ever. Yeah, especially since they were referencing segues heavily, which may have been even more specifically towards the Mall Cop movie because mm -hmm. he wrote a segue. Yeah. I can't believe they made a sequel to that movie. I've never seen the first movie myself, but it didn't seem that interesting. Well, you know, odd things do happen. But I just loved, you know, how he felt so self-important. And, you know, Graham was like, okay, you guys need to disguise yourselves. And apparently what they were wearing made them look like space pirates. Because as soon as they took it off, the mall cop was all, oh, I get it. You space pirates disguising yourselves as ordinary shoppers. Like, okay, so they could have just walked into the mall and it would have been fine. Apparently there are not wanted posters up for the paladins. Though that may change. We don't know how this version of Prince Lothar will act. No, because while certain tenets of the classic Voltron and the classic Go Lion series are brought over, things do change and are variable. Yeah, like how long Shiro is living compared to Sven. Yes. And the fact that Allura is not even trying to pilot any of the lions. She never considered herself a paladin. And the fact that they're not stationary. You know, in the original, while Voltron might have traveled, the castle of winged lions was on planet Eris. In this version, okay, the castle was on planet Eris, but Allura and Koran are Altaian, and Eris was not their homeworld. Mm-hmm. Just this season was very interesting with all the little stuff they dropped. The whole thing with Keith. Also, Hunk. That, those were interesting questions you were asking. I love the, I did not just suddenly turn. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's still the same person you know, guys. He just happens to have found out that he's genetically part of the people you're currently fighting. Yes, that doesn't change anything about who he is. And Hunk, you're kind of being a little insensitive. Mm-hmm. Though the trials were interesting, because I was trying to figure out, why are they letting him through that door? And they keep saying, you're not supposed to go through this door. Apparently, Keith is like most teenagers, and exactly what you tell him not to do is what he's going to do. You are not meant to go through that door. That's not where the fighters were coming from. So why would you want to go through the door? Go through the chute. Makes sense to me. Yeah, and he could have done it sooner. Yes. And apparently they just keep upping the difficulty level until you get it. Yes. Then he finally goes, oh, I guess I wasn't meant to go through that door. Collapse. Good one, genius. About time you figured that out. And then, of course, once you stopped fighting, they went in straight into the mind games of having Shiro try to convince him to give up the blade and trying to have his father convince him to ignore the conflict going on around them. And then hmm. 
I wonder if this is actually foreshadowing for something else that's not happening in this season. It could be foreshadowing, but what happened in those projections were taken from Keith's hopes and fears. Yes, but that doesn't stop the storytellers from using it as an opportunity to foreshadow things. Entirely true. I'm just pointing out that what we saw there was not real. And we know how powerful, you know, dreams and stuff are because of all the stuff with Shiro. I was just about to bring that up. They gave us more backstory on how the lions, at least the black lion, was created. Because that was actually in his vision. Yes. And more about how Shiro actually escaped. Which makes sense. Because there's no way that one earthling could have done all that by himself. Mm-hmm. Two different visions we're talking about here. Yes, but I'm talking about the things that were revealed overall with Shiro, the flashbacks slash dreams he was having while he was being healed at the beginning of the season, and then the stuff that the Black Lion showed him as they were trying to strengthen their bond. Yep, and I was just clarifying for some people who thought we were clumping those two together as one whole thing. But yeah, that whole thing to strengthen their bond was really neat, especially since at the end it's like, he didn't go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> like, didn't go anywhere? Okay. And also that whole thing between Shiro and Zarkon, where Zarkon keeps talking about controlling the Black Lion, and mm -hmm. Shiro's like, nobody controls the Black, Black Lion. Lion? Yeah, so it's like, I'm pretty sure the Black Lion doesn't want to be bonded to Zarkon anymore because he keeps helping Shiro. Mm hmm He found someone better. Shiro is a much nicer guy. Yes. Huh. Is there anything more in particular you want to go over since... I seem to be hopping with my ideas. Yeah, well, we completely went out of sequence here because I wanted to be back more in the earlier episodes. The whole underwater thing with Lance oh, and Hunk. That was such a Lance episode. It was very much a Lance episode. While we still haven't gotten to learn much about Lance, we know that he's a wannabe ladies man and that he's insecure in his abilities and one brief moment in season one we know he misses his family but it feels like out of all the characters we have the least that we know about lance i don't really feel connected to him yeah he seems the most shallow out of all of them and i'm not just talking about personality i'm talking about to us as a character he seems the most shallow currently he doesn't have much to him compared to the others who are getting a little bit more layers to him yeah, so he needs some more work to show us what else is going on with this character. Because there has to be more. You don't write a show like this and leave it just at that. Not for a main character. And speaking of writing, this season so felt like the Clips episodes from The Last Airbender. The whole season, how it builds up, especially the last chunk of this season, where it's all about the battle. Yes, and the group splitting up and each taking care of their own piece to come together with this large final strike that is timed, that they have a time factor that they only have this small window of opportunity to accomplish their goal. Mm -hmm. This so shows that it's the Avatar The Last Airbender and Legend of Korra team that are working on this show, because it feels a lot like them. Yeah, and Lance feels a lot like Sokka, so... I mean, right down to the color scheme. But if I can go back to my episode, please. Yes. So, I mean, it's very Lance to go chasing a mermaid, and there were just some things in that... I didn't pick the food as being the cause of the mind control at first, but it made so much sense with how Hunk was so far under the control, because... Hunk eats. When I started, like, I suspected that it was the food, and then that octopus showed up, and I started questioning it, so I let it play it out until it confirmed, oh yeah, it was definitely the food. Especially when they kept mentioning it was from the garden. Yeah, well, that was the thing, is that whole, as soon as Floor started saying, and we are all safe and warm, I'm like, oh, this is one of those cult villages. And then when the queen said that that garden was the giver of all life, I'm like, oh... We sacrifice things to that garden, don't we? So I went a whole Soylent Green thing of the food being from the people of the village. Boy, I did not go that far. I was just going, something in that garden is eating people. Yes, and then when they sent Flora to go to the garden, I'm like, ooh, we're having an on-screen death here. Yeah, I was surprised about that. 
Yes, a small nitpick for that episode. Apparently the kingdom used to have interstellar contact and so they're able to recognize what a lion is so they're familiar with different alien species. Why call them mercats? It makes no logical sense. It's a lion. It's a mechanical lion. It didn't suddenly grow fins and a tail. It was a nice touch having both Lance and Hunk be the ones to get stuck underwater because the blue lion's element is water, so of course it was operating wonderfully. The yellow lion's element is earth, rock, so of course it was operating more sluggishly. Mm-hmm, because it's designed to apparently move stuff and push stuff out of the way and hold things up because it's nice and big and strong, especially with the upgrade Hunk got. Yes, and then, you know, the whole piece of Keith and Shiro being together and Keith being allowed to pilot the Black Lion. It's interesting that Keith had to ask the Black Lion to help Shiro when the Red Lion just operates independently. That may have been a sign of how the Black Lion's bond with Shiro is weaker and how Zarkon still had some hold on it. That it was not able to fully operate separately even though Shiro was obviously in danger. Also with the splitting of the team, Pidge was the only one that got put by themselves and Pidge was the one that had a very, oh, calm, nothing bad happened. Just like when she went to get her lion, it was all smooth sailing. You know, I was ready for those cute little things to be dangerous. I was ready for there to be the equivalent of a junkyard dog in that debris field for the technology to backfire on her. But none of that happened. Her exile was very calm. Everyone else had problems. And... I feel almost like they're babying her a little bit compared to the other pilots. Things tend to go too easy for her. And they seem to be a little loose with their rules on how the Voltron works. At certain points, it's starting to feel like how at the end of the Thundercat series, the Sword of Omens could do anything. I almost feel like that's kind of happening to Voltron. Oh, we need to do this. Boom! It can do that. We need to do this. Boom! It can do that! Or the lions don't have any power. Oh, they suddenly have power because of the will of the pilots. Yeah, it's getting a little magical MacGuffin there. Though I can, with some of the power-ups, see it because in the first season, we had individual Bayard activations. Some of the stuff we had happen this season required multiple Bayard activations, so it was combination of powers for multiple lions at once. I'm just saying that it, like they better be careful with that because it's feeling a lot of like, let's just toss everything on Voltron. Voltron can do anything. I know he's supposed to be this awesome thing and stuff like that, but pull it back a little bit and follow rules because that gives more grounding and makes people feel like they can be more in this universe. Yeah, I mean, there are times where things are very believable and Voltron's power-ups are starting to feel a little unbelievable. I was perfectly willing to believe that they killed Delora when the ship got hit by the backfire of their lasers. I was just about to, like... Bring that up. Speaking of other mind blows, <laughs> they really pulled a number on Ember. I was willing to believe it because we have seen other people die in the cause of keeping Voltron around. People believe that having Voltron is more important than any one life. We've seen sacrifices from the Blade of Balmora. Allura stated it plainly that, no, we need Voltron more. The only problem is we've also stated that she's connected to the lions in some way. So her being damaged should affect the lions in some way, you would think, and vice versa. Kind of a whole uh, Vision of Escaflone thing when uh, Vaughn got a little too connected to Escaflone and took damage. Yeah, I remember that episode. Still need to watch the redubbing, though. And then... Sticking with uh, things going a little too easy for Pidge, we go to, ooh, I can manipulate this plant by wearing this crown and I get a mech. <laughs> and, ooh, I understand nature now. And now my lion can shoot energy beams that cause vines to grow. I know the green lion's power is wood, but that seems like a slightly ridiculous power, even though it's come in handy three times. Mm -hmm. Though speaking of one of those times, I don't think freezing the vines in that one episode would have increased their strength. 
because making things cold can make them brittle if not done right. Also, it's hot lava acid stuff. It would have melted the ice, so I'm thinking you would have wanted to shoot the ice first and then lay the vines on top of the ice. I think opposite would have worked better. Also nitpick in that episode, those computerized voices were a little hard for me to understand. Yeah, most of the time they were kind of hard for me to understand as well, but I really enjoyed the bad guy in that episode. <laughs> he had so many expressions. It was awesome. And I knew he was going to get away at that. Yeah, he was like pretty much the most expressive Golra that we've seen the whole time because he's wasn't all uptight with the military protocol and action and rapid saw. You know, he's more of, oh, I want off this border duty. Oh, wait, you want me to do actual work in order to get off border? Can I just... Oh, okay, we'll go get Voltron. I love the, we'll die for the cause. Get my pod ready. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Just, I think he was actually the most explosive character throughout so far because he's had the most things shift on his face as he's making an expression and getting an emotion. His ears go up, his ears go down, they twist, they turn, his eyes get bigger, larger. His face actually changes sizes <laughs> as he's making expressions. He was very like... Looney Tune levels of his facial expressions. Yes, compared to pretty much any other character in the entire show so far. Speaking of other characters, we really like, well, at least I really liked. Like Saul, that guy is like, no, I have to get this door right. And there's a reason for that, people. If you, if you think that's just OCD, it's probably not. This guy's probably so smart that he's constantly calculating out what will happen in any event of any change to anything so one small change can make a big difference look it up it's called the butterfly effect or it has to do with quantum physics and stuff like that you know even looking at something changes the outcome of a result yes because it's been hypothesized that the art of observing an event alters the event even if you don't actually interact with it so the small changes and they demonstrate this a bit with his dialogue of you know, talking about the alternate realities and the percentages and, you know, if this, then that, and it all just adds up. And, I mean, it makes him sound very OCD and it would drive me absolutely crazy just like it did the paladins. But that's the problem. It's like he's too smart for his own good because he has so much information that it tends to just freeze him because he's too focused on the data and less on just do it and take a chance. Or he's too scared of the outcome that he really doesn't like happening. Mm -hmm. Even though it has a very small percentage. Because some of the percentages he outlines during Shiro's rescue are very small. I do like the, how do you know that earth nursery rhyme? What do you mean nursery rhyme? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, no, this actually causes this. <laughs> Please continue with other episodes you want to talk about? Well, since we're back on the... Well, I can't say back because we weren't there initially, but since we're on the prison break, I loved how there were two prison cells and each of them was rescuing a different alien. Mm -hmm. And my original thought was that they had somehow separated the mental and physical sides so that the one we first saw being tortured was the pure intellect and the other side that we saw the warden go to was the pure physical aspect. I mean, that has been done in other series where they are like symbiotic. They work together or they're two entities that were separated that should be together. And that reminds me of another part I really liked from that episode. I see where you got confused. <laughs> or I see where you thought that. Because <laughs> he probably literally sees that just by the observation and running through all the data. Yep, I can see that. <laughs> also, considering that it, the yepper pretty much just says yep. 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 So, when you go, are you so-and-so, and it answers yep, okay, good, let's go. And that's when I started thinking that, okay, this is one part of a whole, but it actually wasn't. It was just the warden's pet and the ward. <laughs> yes. And nice opportunity for Lance there at the end to pull off a very difficult shot. Mm-hmm. I wonder if Mr. Um, smart Guy realized, like, if I could do this, he might actually 
No, I have to sneeze first. Yeah, so it's probably figuring out exactly how he had to struggle in order to minimize the likelihood of getting hit by Lance's shot. Also, when did Lance get in his head that he was a sharpshooter? Because he's never been a sharpshooter in any of the episodes. Well, I think he's just trying different things and trying to get his identity. Because we see in the very first episode of season one when they're doing the flight simulator, he's trying to be the ace pilot. Mm-hmm. That's a good point. I'm going to throw the needle. <laughs> Oops. Yes. I just feel like they do a lot of that. The whole making you think it's one thing and then flipping it to another thing. Mm -hmm. Like we think they're actually on a mission in the episode until we realize, oh, it's a simulator. Or, oh, I traveled halfway across the galaxy to see this event. Oh, I was actually in the castle the entire time. That's another thing about that particular episode is, didn't the, anyone notice that Shiro left? But then we find out that, oh, he didn't actually leave. That explains everything. Yes. But let's talk about uh, Allura and Keith leaving together. You know, each of them believing that, oh, I might be the reason that Zarkon's tracking. Yeah, that's another thing. Them trying to eliminate themselves from the problem and figure out if they're the problem, they should have also taken two separate ships and headed two separate directions. Because if they're together and they get found, you don't know if it was both of them, one of them, which one. You just find out that it's one of them. Now what? <laughs> Yeah, it narrowed down the variables, but they still needed to be totally separate, which is what they were originally going to do until they accidentally ran into each other while they were each trying to get a pod. Mm -hmm. I'm just wandering around here at night in the bay. With all my gear. <laughs> and she didn't pack a thing. No. Well, she travels light. That makes me wonder, is she some type of, is she like more important than we think because she's magical or something because of that whole thing that happened in that very end episode when she was fighting Hagar? Oh, she's probably very important, considering that we now know her father built the Black Lion. Hmm, that's because we haven't had a mention of her mother yet. Does she have a mother? Yes, but it's not one of those things that really got mentioned in the original Voltron. I'm not sure about the original Go Lion. Have they mentioned a mother in this series yet? For Allura, no. Not that I recall. I'm starting to wonder about stuff like, hmm. Also, nice callback to the old series with the mice performing for Allura. And braiding her hair. Yes. Wonderful hairstyle. Yes, well, apparently it's very boring and lonely in the castle all by yourself. And that was much nicer than the flashback we have in 80s Voltron where... She talks about how lonely it is to be the child of royalty and how the mice used to entertain her. And we get this lovely little scene of the mice wearing little dresses and doing can-can dances with spins. This was much more realistic, if one could say that about performing mice. Speaking of that stuff, it just reminded me from uh, that mall episode, the part of, I, I would like something shiny. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, she gets stuck staying on the ship, and no one brings her back anything. Shiny! Well, I mean, the lenses were technically shiny, but they were more for the ship than for her. And then there was that wonderful thing of, like, we need to leave now. Is that one of these sisters? Oh, my God, that's a game. That's a game. Oh, my God. And then the very end, there's no way to hook it up. It's like, kids, you're a genius. I'm sure you can figure out a workaround. Yeah, especially since they would also have to figure out how to hook up the power. Yeah, but that was just so sad at the end. I was like, really, bitch? You didn't think about this. You're the techno geek, which was pointed out repeatedly this season. God, it felt like more so than last season. Should we go more over that Mott episode with those little other events that happened with each of the separate paladins and Koran? <laughs> yes, Hunk's uh, foray into the food court, checking out the free samples, and then misstepping with the least tasty thing he had tried actually being one that cost money, and him taking over the kitchen Hell's Kitchen style, throwing tantrums and being like, if it is not perfect, it will not go out. I said medium well, what is this? And totally having the owner, who has him prisoner, being subservient. And then going, I don't care how long it takes, we're going to get him back in this place. Yes, so that would actually be interesting to see in season three, the guy finding Hunk. Or him chasing after Hunk going, I need you back in my kitchen. And Hunk's like, 
look, dude, I appreciate it, but I'm part of Team Voltron. That kind of takes priority. And we're already down a member, so... Yeah. And then Pidge and Lance in the fountain trying to get all the coins. I have been tempted to do that so many times, but you're not supposed to do that, and I don't want to get yelled at, kicked out, arrested, etc. And I feel so sorry for that kid. Yeah, I'm like, Lance would have really killed you to let the coin hit the water first. Though if I was a kid, I would have gone, did that guy just grab it in his teeth? Dolphin style? Assuming that the kid knows what a dolphin is. Or whatever creature that happens to leap like that out of water on his home planet, wherever that happens to be, if it has water. Mm -hmm. But you know what I mean. Yeah. So it would have been like, also, I don't think the kid's ever seen a human, so it's like... <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't think that humans are very common, but... Most of the alien species, like the Altaeans and the Gora, they look somewhat humanoid, even though they have secondary biological features that are different from humans. I just remembered what's happening to that woman's face. It's cracking. <laughs> She's smiling. She's enjoying her food. I just love how he's like, I don't know what that is. I've never seen my customers smile before. Yeah, I'm like, I'm impressed you have customers. Also interesting that his name was rapid sal which sounds a lot like rapid salt which is the gulra salute hmm good point i also like the bargaining tactics now going on to koran that koran mm -hmm. it's koran yeah i'm going now going into koran i love his bargaining tactics i want your first first board no i'm like this it's not worth anything I'm... yeah it's like oh those i'm like oh koran you immediately overreacted Oh, yeah, they are pretty ugly. I do have an empty curio of ugly items. I, I could give you a used handkerchief for it. <laughs> it's like, your first board, your left foot. <laughs> <laughs> and then he finally makes the deal, and then the shopkeeper finds out what they actually were, and he's like, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> and Koran's like, no trade backs. Uh, Koran. Yeah, so as much as the... 80s version Koran is steeped in tradition. They kept that with this Koran because so much is traditional. Mm -hmm. But he's such a comedic element in the show. And I, I love how um, that video was so totally broken. Completely and utterly, though, nitpick there. If you need to set off the creature's laser in order to collect the skull trite, why is rule number one? Don't get in front of the face. There's probably a set of rules you use when you're approaching it, and then rules you use once you're trying to get the stuff. Yes, but once you're inside, isn't it a little difficult to trigger the weapon reaction from the outside? Yeah, I thought they would have to poke some glands or something to get a reaction happening on the inside. Yeah, but no, instead we went with the comedic route of Hunk being farted out of the beast so that he could get back to his lion. They actually say that in the show. Yeah. So that he could get back to his lion and trigger the reaction. And if the reaction is what causes the skull trite to be created, and they triggered that reaction of the laser on approach, shouldn't there have already been some skull trite in the third stomach? Well, I have... I have... Well, I hypothesize. <laughs> Lux thinks. I hypothesize that there's an internal clean-out system that cleaned it out before they could get there because of how long they took to actually get in there once they actually got in. You know what I mean. Because the thing has three stomachs. Yes, and it was in the third stomach, which means that that is near the end of the digestive tract. Based on the diagram, how did that stuff get all the way from the back to the front? Because the stomachs were arranged in like a triangle. So you had the back one here, then you had the first one a little bit higher, and then you had the middle one lower. And the things that connected them did kind of a, you know, it kind of created the bottom of the triangle. So how does that stuff that falls out in a straight line go from there to there to there to there? <laughs> well, not everything would necessarily have to pass through all the stomachs. You know, there could be, depending on the matter that's taken in from the desiccated planets, it could be separated by the system based on the type of processing it needs. But yeah, Koran's video and the file being corrupted because it's so old. Mm-hmm. Which is actually quite possible. Mm-hmm. I'm like, wouldn't you have checked that before giving it to them? Yeah, I don't think he did. No, obviously not. And there wasn't time for them to watch it before because everything was on a tight timeline. And another thing about Koran and the first couple episodes where he was rowing back, his whole teenage stage was hilarious. Yeah. And Allura 
you know, I would love an explanation for why the time loop wasn't affecting her, but she just took on every single adult role as Koran kept getting younger and younger. She was just right in line for oh, the face palm when he's in his, don't worry, princess, I've got this <laughs> age compared to Koran, turn that racket down when he's playing his music to yelling at the child version to holding the toddler version to baby talking the infant version. I bet you have more episodes to go over. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's a little difficult when we jump so much out of order. Because, like, I had all these logical thoughts and things that I was going to cover, and then Lux just started running to the finale. Well, we, we, it was the last thing we watched, so. Yes. Good thing we started with a spoiler tag. Uh, another small nitpick for Pidge being by herself in the junkyard. Even when she's talking out loud to herself and referring in the third person, in a time that she's totally alone, she still manages to call herself Pidge and not Katie. Hmm. Well, if you keep it up long enough, it becomes ingrained in you. Yes, but it's like, okay, so how long was she keeping up the charade at the school? And she's still keeping to the name Pidge even after she admitted to the Voltron team that she was a girl. And Shiro knows her real name is Katie. But Shiro, even in times of stress, is calling Katie Pidge. Well, that's how they initially got to know her, so that's the first thing he actually has in his head, even if she was revealed to be Katie, so he's reverting to Pidge. Also, I think Pidge was probably a nickname her family gave her, and that's why she went with it. It could have been possible. It would be nice to know why she picked Pidge, but we do know that Shiro knew she was Katie. That was revealed in Season 1. He called her by name. So I just think it was interesting that completely alone and introspective, she was still referring to herself by the assumed name rather than the given name. And she keeps saying she's searching for her family. She's searching for her brother, specifically. It's not her father. It's her brother. It's always Matt. It's never her father. Well, I think they are maybe twins? Oh, definitely twins. But she always says, my family but she always means my brother. I don't think it's really bothering Keith a whole lot that he's part Gulra. It's more of he wants to know more of the history, and it's bothering him how his friends and allies are treating him now that he's part Gulra. Because I don't think it matters nearly as much to him as it does to Allura. I think he just wants to find out what's the connection with his family and the Galra, and specifically this order. Yes, because he just wanted to know about his past, and whatever that is, he wants to know it. Whether it's Galra, or Altaian, or Earth, it doesn't matter. He just wants to know. Mm -hmm. he, he just wants to know what's going on. He's always had this thing. His family apparently has always had it, so we don't know how long it is. He may be half Galra, he may be a quarter, he may be, you know, an eighth. We don't know. We might eventually find out, but I'd like to see more on that arc because that's where we've kind of seemed to have the most depth, especially this season. I'd like to see a little more from Pidge. She and Allura are feeling a bit Mary Sue-ish to me, so I'd like to see some fixes for that. Even though we've seen Allura collapse multiple times from doing stupid, dangerous, suicidal things. Yeah, it's the fact that she's collapsed. You've kind of taken the importance out of it, the fact of how many times she's collapsed. Because she always comes to again fairly quickly and, oh, she just needs to rest. It's like, she never gets put in the medical pods like mm -hmm. the other characters who get injured. And except for that fake out because I was willing to believe that they were going to kill her. And then they turn around and just totally undo that concern by giving her a new power up at the end of the episode. So I really like this Allura more than the 80s princess version. So I like that she's a strong, independent woman and that she still has issues that she's working through. But could she please be a little less Mary Sue? I mean, if this keeps up, we're going to find out that she's somehow some ancient Altaian goddess. Possible. <laughs> so, what are your final thoughts on this season? Really enjoyed it. Wish I'd known going in that it was a shorter season because I was really holding how quickly they brought the team back together against them, but with only 13 episodes to work with, it makes more sense. Really interested to see season three. I remember liking that 
stuff that went on with Prince Lothor in the 80s version as a kid. I'm interested to see what they'll do with the character and um, how long it's going to take Zarkon to recover and how the overall dynamic is going to change with the Voltron Force and Princess Allura and Koran now knowing that Hagar is Altaian and that they're fighting against one of the last Altaians in existence. And another theory that just popped in my head, specifically on a replacement pilot, how about it's Koran? He tried. Mm-hmm. Apparently one of his relatives was a um, paladin because he said, I finally get to follow in your footsteps. When he was wearing the outfit, he actually said that. He goes, I finally get to follow in this person's footsteps. Yeah, I thought he was referring to King Althor. I don't think so. It didn't sound like he said King Althor. He would have said King something. That He didn't say King. He said the person's full name. Okay. Oh, well. I really enjoyed this season. It was awesome. And I'm pretty sure I heard somewhere that they actually already gave them the money for season three. Or at least already planned for a third season. Because Netflix usually buys the first season, sees how well it does. And then pays for two more. <laughs> and with considering how well they've done this year, I think we're going to see more episodes. I really hope so, because this is a reboot that I am definitely enjoying. Netflix, would you please spend money on two things for me? Go and get the team that was doing the Thundercats reboot. Get them to work on that again. And two, for the love of God, go to Hallmark and buy the rights to Rainbow Bright. Please. And that is all. And this has been our thoughts on Voltron, Legendary Defender, Season 2. Thanks for listening. Please click subscribe and share this video with your friends if you think they'd enjoy it. Also, go check out some other videos. We talk about a lot of things. If you would like to support this channel financially, please see our Patreon and Coffee links. Like Lux's art and want to see more? You can check him out on DeviantArt, Tumblr, and Twitter.